areas that are restricted access, compare those with some around the villages and that sort of stuff, and try, try and tell a story to the locals about, well, you know, if you want to protect your resources, this is what you've got to do. And there were people working on sediments and, re, you know, coral health, people working on the catchment and water quality that, that, you know, coming into the lagoon. And this is very much a sort of, you know, sort of white man flies in and explains it to the locals about how things should go, you know. This is the initial mind, sort of framing mindset. It was like bizarre. Many of you will be totally over this and have healed yourselves of this sort of approach to doing things. Very rapidly learning sort of kicked in and it became very, very apparent about ways in which you had to, you needed to interact with the local communities over there. So quite 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 early on, you know, so Tononi Vaka means white man basically. So if you if someone refers to you as Tononi Vaka and you hear a conversation it means they're talking about you basically, right? Mm -hmm. Tononi Paihana is what they call me, which is about who basically means man belong fish. Alright, so I was like all like the fish. I'd learned all the Morovo names and there are there are many, many languages in the Solomon Islands, alright? And every lagoon has its own distinct distinct with integrations of local language. So in Morovo, the word for fish is Ihana. As you move up New Georgia into Robiana Lagoon, which is just a day's boat ride away, it's Igana. Yeah. So there are subtle changes in names as you go through. And as you will understand, trying to understand natural resources and more important people, you have to speak in the local language. So pidgin English, me cussing a little bit pissing, me got them ting ting, maybe think of um, something resource long. Like, you know, so you have to learn pigeon to be able to, to be widely understood in the Solomons, Papua New Guinea, Vanuatu, for example. Okay, but that that in terms of a conversation only gets you as far as fis. All right, so fis f i s is basically um, is basically uh, pigeon for fish. Now, of course, understanding the diversity and functional redundancy among fish populations, you can't you can't just communicate using fis. So you need to know you need to learn the local language names for all those fishes, all right? So there's one I particularly like, which is, you know the great Maori wrasse? You know the big hump-headed Maori wrasse, that big thing? So the little ones, so often they will differentiate, names will be differentiated, the small versions of something and large versions of something. So the small, young hump-headed Maori wrasse, uh, Chilinus ogulatus in Latin, are known as Chichikamujiki. And Chichikamujiki in Morovo means bait stealer, little bait stealer, <laughs> like a little nuisance, all right? And it's the one that comes along and whips the bait, you know, the hermit crab off the hook or whatever and never gets caught. So Chichikamujiki. And there's a whole bunch of other things. Things like uh, Kiso is shark, yeah? Vua is crocodile. Great word, you know, great strong words, you know? And then, so being able to communicate is like really, really important. It's, it's, it's an emblem of respect, yeah? So, in that sense, that was important. So going from Tsunami Baka to Tsunami Bahana, Ahana was really just getting, because fish is so important, or marine resources are so important to these communities, that everyone's happy to chat about fish, all right? So it really became quite an important thing. The other thing was going to church. Now, part of my family is SDA, all right? So Seventh-day Adventist. And then the Solomons, because of the fairly recent and pervasive influence of various um, various folks interested in, in, in pushing various forms of biblical understanding of the Bible. Uh, virtually every community is deeply religious. All right? They have all sorts of shades of religion, depending upon the history of the folks that went in there to, to, to proselytize. Um, in Morovo Lagoon, it's predominantly Seventh day Adventists, all right? and they, Seventh day Adventists keep Saturday the Sabbath. Sabbath all right? So, Seventh day Adventists don't work on Sabbath. If you're in the community, you must not work on Sabbath. All right. If you want to do something like going for a dive or a swim or a snorkel or something like that, you do it on quietly, yeah, out of the way. Um, all communities, if it's a united, you can tell quite quickly from the, the array of resources about which community it is. All right. So SDAs don't eat uh, shellfish. They don't eat crab. All right. So if you see land crabs, you know, walking, around, you know, walking around the village, you can bet that's probably an SDA community. You'll find lots of lobsters nearby, you'll see lots of deo, which are the uh, clam, mangrove clam, and there'll be heaps of resources that the SDAs don't touch in their area. As you go to a United Village, basically they eat everything. Um, they dance, they play frivolous music, non-biblical music, um, and they observe Sundays. And, but the church is a method of accessing 
the community. And our church is very influential in as a meeting place where messages are delivered on protecting resources, messages delivered on education, reminders about paying school fees and you know the evils of various things. So the church really binds the community together. And if you want to get in, if you want to move into a community and start doing research in the community, you need to go to church, basically. You need to suck up on the ideas you have and, and, and you know, I've been the subject of sermons. It's that serious. And then I've been asked about how Queen Elizabeth is and that sort of, you know, they think I'm making for some reason, I don't know why. That is fair. <laughs> so the church is really important. And also every meeting that you hold, if you hold a meeting there about maybe there's a some research team you want to go and work in an area over there, then basically that meeting has to start with a prayer, right? And you call on the senior village elder or the pastor, if the pastor's there, and say, would, would you kindly say a prayer to bless this meeting? And then the meeting kicks off with a prayer. And often it will end with a prayer as well. So right, these are learnings that like, we get fairly isolated from in our sort of heathen world over here, you know what I mean? So, but over there, you're functioning in their country. So respect is about respecting their religion. It's respecting codes of dress. So when I take classes over there, they basically have to dress respectfully, all right? not wander around in the sorts of gear that some kids wander around in over, over here. It's definitely against God. Uh, the other thing is multidisciplinarity. So I'm not going to go through all the names here, but basically, you know, working in teams over there, it's really, really important to address different aspects of particular research questions and or find somebody who's had experience in that area. People like uh, Simon Albert, for example, has worked throughout the region. He's worked at PNG, uh, Vanuatu, um, and Solomons and Fiji and elsewhere, very well experienced, fluent in pidgin and a number of local languages, and a range of others, five more, um, also strong with Solomon. So, if you do want to go work over there, have a conversation, have a cup of coffee over here first. You know, I learned a huge amount from Annie Ross. We gave a seminar a week or so ago here, uh, a, a huge amount about how one best deal with, um, or best, best engage with communities over there. So then you George, so that was Morovo, and then so 15 years ago, a lot of, I've been traveling there a lot. Um, and then, <laughs> there's an anecdote I can tell you, but I won't, I don't have time, but anyway, about, about Munda, and my, the way of my head framed about the complex, how sophisticated various places were. Munda was the site of the second largest battle in the Second World War between the Americans and the Japanese, the Americans, Australians, Japanese, all right? Really big battle. They landed in uh, this top end of New Georgia. This is Bungaloo down here, so this is Morovo, just to give you the location, and then up here is New Georgia. The Americans landed up here, and then hiked across and attacked the airfield of Munda, where the Japanese had been sort of hiding their planes under you know, coconut trees and that sort of stuff. Massive battle there. Um, but thankfully, the, Jap the, the benefit of the Second World War to moving around the Solomons is that all the good airstrips that are in there that were put in by the military, right? So Munda is actually now plus an international airstrip, or an international airport. It's fenced all the way around. It's got 24 lights. It's got ambulances and fire engines and that sort of thing. This is a pretty sophisticated outfit. And the 737 now lands there. So you can fly from Brisbane to Munda without having to stay through Honiara, which is a huge relief for us. So. Brisbane, Munda, wonderful flight. And then you land there, basically you've got a 737 sitting in a village. All right, so, <laughs> so amazing. <laughs> Bizarre. Yeah, anyway, know, so an awesome place. I mean, I'll show you a couple of photographs and tip. So, backing up a little bit back to 2000, all right, so before the start of the Solomon's engagement, I've set up a program with the University of California Education Abroad System, which is, um, which is, focused around marine biology, about 70% with some terrestrial ecology chucked in and some human cultural kind of stuff. And that's been running ever since, runs annually in the second semester. So it goes to Montmeau Research Station, which is significant for our discussion, all right? So that, this is not irrelevant to a lot of non sequitur, it's actually very relevant to our discussion. And I bring a bunch of students out each year to go study over there, do some stuff. Out of that relationship, um, I was traveling back from Peru um, a few years ago, and I had to have a copy of the book that Simon Albert, myself, and James Udy wrote on the marine life of the Solomon Islands. And I was passing through LA, so I thought I'd just duck up to Santa Barbara, which is about an hour and a half north of LA, and just like drop a copy of the book on the desk and say, well, have a think about this. You know, we could do something over there. 
And they kind of took that, um, and we then developed the Australia Solomon Islands program from that, which takes between 17 and 30 students over the Solomon Islands, and we run a program on community environmental health. So basically it's more, rather than natural systems focus, it's like framed around the community. Yeah? And when they go over there, they're embedded in the community. I, I usually go over, a representative goes over the year before, or, let, you know, or er, very early in the year, seeks a meeting with the elders, has a prayer to open it, and then asks the community, represented by the elders, about what their research priorities are for their village. Right? So if someone wants to go in there, if we come over here with some equipment, we'll have some machines to go ping, we'll have some stuff to incubate stuff, we can get, we've got some microscopes and things, we can basically go and answer whatever questions within our framework you would like us to. What are your research priorities? So then we bring those back, we formulate those into some research group sort of things. We split the, uh, the, the students up into groups, and then they start to learn the skills associated with that particular thing. So if it's, for example, uh, food, um, food security, and sort of food health, food-related health, then there'll be a household survey, for example. We design a survey, get it approved by ethics, and then basically, when the students go over, they carry out these household surveys where a whole range of questions are asked, and then those get formulated in a response. So that's basically what it is. And the students go and do homestays in the village, and they basically go and work in the garden, and help prepare the food, and all that sort of stuff, right? So they're, they're embedded in there. And we also look at a bit of reef and forest health as well, so the natural resource side of things. So that was the, that's how we framed it in 2017, and it's run 2017, 2018, it ran this year, and it's definitely going to run next year, and it seems to be trundling out. So remember, this one started in 2000, and it's still going, all right, maybe 20 years later. And then this one's in its fourth iteration is being planned at the moment, so it's going to, going to carry on. So these are some of the areas, this is near Nusa Tuba. Um, Nusa Tuba is a little island on the edge of a vol extinct volcano called Kolumbango. Kolumbango is a big, it's a perfect, wonderful cone. And it's got beautiful rainforest on it, cloud forest and sort of stuff. It's the second highest part of the Solomons. Really wonderful stuff. Um, the resources, some of the folks are putting up with quite strange things. What, where we're going here is coming from Nusa, Nusa Tuba, this little island on the side of Kolumbango where they had no fresh water. Right? They had a well, but now it's, it's quite close to where the septic system for the Tinoni Vaca toilet is. All right? So there's, there's often Tinoni Vaca toilets. All right? So you go to a place, folks usually just like wander into the lagoon and then have a little bit of what, a wee or whatever. Um, but when you want to attract Tinoni Vaca, you need to give them a toilet to throw, all right? subject to quite fascination among most people. So there's a, like a European toilet sitting there in a little hut thing, and um, some toilet paper and that sort of stuff, and of course then it goes to a septic somewhere, but um, you know, the, this is some of the subtle influence we have on communities, so their Tononi Baka toilet was very close to their well, and now the well is poisoned, so they now have to get in a canoe, so if they want to wash, if they want to have fresh water, they've got to get in canoes and go for a, several kilometres to where a stream runs down from the main island of Columbanda. And we did it as well, when the students and I were over there, we were we'd basically get in a canoe in the afternoon, we'd load up with our water bottles, we'd go up to this little stream, and this is this young lady sitting on the front of the canoe as we go up the stream towards where the fresh water section is, and then basically we'd, we'd soap up and wash and gather water, and then we'd go in the canoe, and we'd stick it back in the canoe, and then back to the village. So. Yeah, multiple impacts we have, but an interesting problem for the locals um, from some of our activity. This is a student doing a household survey in one of the ladies' kitchens. Um, pretty evocative. This is uh, Sophie Bartley, one of the students from uh, La this year. Sorry, this is June this year. Um, this is uh, Regina Cunahan, uh, or Suter, rather, she called Suter. She was a PhD student many years ago. And she's leading the water program. So she's looking at incubations of uh, cultures for E. coli. So we go and sample people's water resources and then find out whether or not they've got fecal contamination in there. And then provide them with ways of overcoming that fecal contamination, different ways of doing things, keeping pets away from water sources and this sort of stuff. 
uh, Danny. So this is one of the questions that came up from the village was they uh, this is Dunde and other villages so that that one was Kindu for this is Dunde. These are 44 gallon drums for fuel and stuff used during the Second World War. They've been used here as a basement for a big concrete slab that then had a large building, a hospital on top of it. Yeah. So in this this is in Western Province still where this battle took place during the Second World War. The locals were worried that this was harboring, you know, leaks and sort of stuff. Water was going into it, it was harboring mosquito, right? Well, the, um, the dengue mosquito, and indeed it, not these, but these things, when we did the research, we couldn't find any dengue mosquito in here, but certainly coconuts, you know, tin cans, a very small water resource, just very small amounts of water, contained lots of these dengue, potentially dengue vector mosquitoes. So this was the 2017 program. So this is important, okay? So it's important for them to know they're worried about dengue. They thought this was going to drive a dengue outbreak if it happened, but it was actually how they were managing things like coconuts. Yeah. Big piece of information, right? In 2017, research reports were prepared and translated into language, both Morovo, sorry, Roviana, and also Pigeon. And then we made posters, and that took some months to get the information going back. And then it was given to the community some nine months later. And I traveled over there, gave posters out at church and that sort of stuff, and, and talked to the community about it. That was nine months after. Right? And I had this sort of, and this, this, these are just hand grenades from the, the local guy that just collects hand grenades. Right? So the whole place is like, when they're, when, they're, when they're making a garden over there, so you know the way they do rotational gardening in tropical forests, okay? they basically you know, have a sort of, bit of a rotational thing, they'll cut some trees down. They'll burn all that stuff, and then they rich soil, and they'll cultivate it until it gets a little bit tired, and then they'll go and cut another area down, right? But so burning is the key part of it, burning the wood that you chop down. But where they've had lots of military action, you've got hand grenades, mortar shells, bombs under there. Basically, they light the fire and then run away. And then when the explosion stops, then they go back and start farming, right? So it's kind of interesting the way. And also, when you're writing up like risk assessments for field trips, you know, death by bomb. Like, you know. <laughs> they get ethics approval. Yeah. For no, no, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so anyway, then I had this like, kind of epiphany thing, right? Or really, like, a, it, like common sense, right? Here we are going into these communities, and we're finding out real, real-time facts about how their circumstance is. You know, do you have dengue? Do you, is your water supply polluted? Is your child going to get sick? All right. And here we are spending nine months translating a language before we get it back to them. And I thought, sort of, <laughs> well, we better, we ought really to pay respect to actually tell people real time what the what the issues are, so they can take some action. Not wait nine months for a government report to come out, you know. So we actually now have moved to a situation where this year we trained the kids in Pigeon, right? We got them help with translating stuff for posters, and then they delivered the information they found out back to the community real time as soon as they finished analysing the results. And it was pretty, it was, this is just one of the examples about ecotourism. They're worried about this airport going in and what was the impact on their community was going to be about ecotourism. That was one of the research things they want us to focus on. So this is actually written in, you know, bring our Keta community together, which is easy, it's pigeon, it means just bring everyone in the community together. Right? Or improving Saturday law tourism, that's improved knowledge about tourism. Yeah. So the, the students were learning language to communicate to folks in their language, which is a really important thing, get yeah, respect. Right? So. Have you found, um, so you know, have you found that people understand graphs well? It's difficult. One of the challenges early on were maps. Um, trying to show people maps of an area and point to something or other when the, the georeference is different, or was different, now it's changed with the mobile phones. Graphs you have to explain, all right, just carefully, but they, they get it pretty quickly. I mean, they get these things in school nowadays, so it's, it's pretty good. But yeah, you've got to be careful about how you're communicating about things. Yeah, we and always check for understanding. Like, make a graph, make a map, but I've yeah. also found other places that's not instantly. It, no, not at all. So you've got to build, build understanding. There's a lot, a lot. There's a lot of interest in, in. The way science is done because so many scientists come through. Right, I live in Intrapilly. What time is it? Mate, for my lady. <laughs> I live in Intrapilly, right? I can't remember the last time a scientist sort of walked through my backyard, 
studying what well, you know frogs in my pond. I'd be happy if they did, but we find I can't remember the last time I sat down in the household survey. These people see so many scientists come through. <laughs> Basically, it's part of their income is from researchers or education groups coming through. They support the sizable uh, component of the cash economy over there. Right? So they're used to science. They're, they're quite well framed, particularly in these high visit areas. If you go to somewhere like Rennell, for example, you're way off the big track, Rennell Island or Tomotu or one of the other far flung uh, provinces, that understanding isn't there. So you have to build up what this means. You know, so anyway, yeah, I better press on. But yeah, good question. What about back here? All right, I'm I'm visiting people's country. I've been doing it for 30 years, all right? and I've been doing it with some respect but not full respect. Right? So, some, so when I was uh, raising money for the research station over at Dunwich, so I bought my research station around and raised a million dollars from industry to go and help build that. That was back in the 90s. So in 90, 94, 95, I had a series of meetings with the uh, Minjeriba, Morgolpin, Elders and Council. That means Strawberry Island, Morton Island, the Elders and Council, so all the families there, about what they wanted out of the thing that we might do over there. Right? But that was like touch, really. It was, you know, couple of meetings on the back deck of the research station to try and identify what research activities they wanted to do. And then that, that faded, you know, you've got to build the thing, you've got to run the thing, and that sort of stuff, so different priorities took over. It was only really then when I was thinking about the way we engage with communities in Solomon, so really that should be the way we engage with communities over here, because we're wandering around their backyard, so, you know, a place they've looked after 6,000 years. We did in the recent iteration, 24,000 years if you go to the archaeological records at the moment, yeah. So the 24,000 years, these folks have been looking after marine resources in these areas, terrestrial resources in these areas, it's taken us less than 200 to f*** right up. Right? So, and then we're scratching around how to do it. We've like invaded three million people sitting on, you know, it's like bizarre scale. And now there is strong pushback, which is, again, respect, it's welcome, right? So what's going on here? So the, um, Noogie are basically on uh, on Mugolpin, which is uh, Morton Island. New Knuckle and Gurunpal Pans are basically uh, Stradbroke Island, all right, or Mijero. So they got a determination, and so now they have some rights over this space. They've got some exclusive rights where basically you need permission to walk on to certain parts of the land from them directly, and then there are non exclusive rights where you've actually got to sort of let them know about stuff, all right, when you're doing a thing in there. They, they don't have to write a veto over it, but let them know. So this is the overall claim stretched up around Morton Island. Morton Island is shortly going to be declared, not already. And then most of the active claim at the moment is around Minjeriba and the bay around there. All right, stretching. This actually stretches down to the Gold Coast if you want to size it's the scale here. All right, this is a big area of the sea, the land of sea. So a big area. The two key two key agencies, I think, from our perspective, the Quantum Field Aboriginal Aboriginal Corporation. They're the ones vested with the power under that um, determination to, to, to look after that and act it. And then sitting sort of down to the side of the Kwanamooka Aboriginal Land Sea Management Agency, Polsmar. Polsmar is led by Darren Cameron, uh, sorry, okay, so uh, Cameron Costello leads Kayak, basically, and then Darren Cameron leads Polsmar. Polsmar look after the rangers, which look after sea and land country on Minjeriba. So these folks are really critical. These folks are very good at gender politics. These folks can be very direct, as they should be, all right, about what's important for them and it was about um, respecting access to the, to the country. All right? So that's really the main, main message here. So these are the two agencies, Kayak and Polsma. Um, so Kayak has a set of protocols. Um, they've had these protocols for a number of years now. Basically, these are the general ones about if you want to visit, then 14, two weeks beforehand, let them know you want to come over, all right? Or enter that part of more based on determination. So, dignitaries have some rules there, as so UQ has rules about inviting dignitaries. Um, decisions, they need to be involved in decisions about stuff. So, if you, you know, putting together some thing that's going to be a submission to somewhere or other, what I do now is actually reference them and send a copy to Kayak. So they understand what I, you know, what I'm intending to do. They've got a proposal about a certain thing. So, for example, with the Tunda Harbour issue that came up, 
the terms of reference were made available from the Federal Minister and I put in a submission to that and then copied in before we sent it, sent it across to the leader agencies of Kayak and then got them to, so they are aware of what we were going to suggest and they actually suggested some things we could add on behalf of the sort of cultural system, so in terms of leaders there. So policy and planning, any of those things, they need to be involved. Then this, um, everyone knows about this document, Toward and Glad Tomorrow. Has everyone read this? No? That's important. It's a MOU between the University of Queensland and Kayak, all right? A specific MOU that's going to describe how we interact. So MOU is Memorandum of, Memoranda of Understanding. The meet are largely descriptive, and they are often seldom prescriptive. So they, they will mention elements, but there will be no, not a lot of substance around those things. It's for, for individuals to take those up and use that under the, under the MOU. So to all glad tomorrow. If anybody wants me to send them around copies of these, I'm happy to send you around protocols and other things. So UQ, what does UQ want? Collaborative and impactful research and teaching opportunities. Work integrated learning for students. So particularly, I'm thinking here for master students who might have an interest in working in communities, then this would be a very good sort of framework under which to sort of to, to mount that. Uh, engagement with local community visitors. So interaction is really important. Um, and that we act appropriately. All right? So if you don't know the protocols, you might be running into some problems. Uh, we've had an example. So that's what UQ wants out of it. What does Kayak want out of it? Enduring partnership with UQ. Right? We've had a partnership for a while. It's been very, fairly loose. Um, they also want, they in, inherently want our support for um, basically their native title bids. And also there's a bid for uh, basic biodiversity slash cultural heritage, world heritage listing for Walker Bay, Wanda Walker. All right. So that's a great interest. In. Meaningful dialogue and collaboration. All right. Meaningful is the key word here. All right. So the dialogue has to be substantive. All right? It's not just a casual conversation, or oh, by the way, or whatever. It's engaging over a period of time with a structured series of activities. Education and training opportunities for common local people. So in the same way that we want work, work integrated learning opportunities for our students, they also want opportunities for their people to understand and learn. Joint research, development projects. There's a whole bunch of things at the moment that are in the development plan for North Stradbroke Farm. So you know mining's closing down and they've got this big economic, pack, economic package. We should have been engaged with that from 2010, but due to various problems over the big grade building, that didn't happen. We really just really, really seriously got engaged in that process. So there's a bunch of things we're going to be doing in the future over there that are worthy of note. Now these are really what I, these are my pro personal protocols, all right? Now as I mentioned with when I'm working in Solomon Islands, I or a representative of mine will go over and meet with the elders and then ask them about their research priorities and how they would like us to work and how, you know, all those sort of structures go on. Hitherto, we've never had that here, and now we need to have that here, all right? So these are learnings from Solomon's brought over here. So I now send a copy of the teaching itineraries, and I make the coordinators of the various programs that I look after, send copies of their teaching itinerary to Kayak and Cosma. Cosma are the folks that run the rangers, right? And rangers are the people that want to engage. They're very, they're very interested in engaging and you know, understanding what we teach and helping out with that in some respects. So I, I, because it's a complex thing with lots of people, they need to know that early. Invite participation with Walsh my Rangers. Jacob Martin's the head, a lovely man, and he's, he's uh, willing to listen. Uh, inquire about potential touch points. So if you're going over there working, this is, this, this is both research and for teaching, and think, oh, I'm going to be going into a mangrove area to collect some something or others or whatever, you know. If it's in a green zone area, then you need to let these folks know so they understand what's going on. You know? um, if you're visiting oyster leases, for example, that's a touch point. If you're visiting certain, certain important cultural sites, even though your work might not be on cultural matters, because you're accessing those sites, that's a potential touch point. So you need to be aware of those and do like a risk analysis on those. So basically the research one, the same as those, I'd just I'd shorten up the, the consultation time in, in scale, in, in, in respect to the scale of your activity. If you're taking 55 students over there, that's a big 
noisy footprint, all right? And lots of folks will know you need to have that rounded out. If you're going over doing a little bit of you know, a little bit of sampling plankton or something or other, it's much less, much injurious. So risk assessment. And the other thing, in the same way now that we give back to communities in the Solomons by giving them reports straight away about issues. Now obviously they don't want to be snowed under by lots of scientific papers, but it might help just to give them a synopsis or at least provide a list of activities you're doing, research sort of outcomes, uh, and then ask them if they'd like any of those amplified. And just a short amplification would satisfy the thing. And then they can uh, follow that up later. <coughs> so maintaining dialogues are important. There are long-term monitoring program opportunities. Sorry. LTMPs, all right? We need to be working out what do we need to be monitoring in the area. Things like invasive species be sensible. Uh, things like Puh uh, Puhaka, that's the rover word, sea gums. Uh, sea gums and things like this. Be aware and get involved as kayak updates as protocols, right? So we'll start stripping those around. There'll be a structure for those dollars. We need to put some dollars into this to actually enable some of this exchange of ideas to go on. I think two things we need to do is protect booby shores. Lots and lots of people visit the shores of Dunwich there for a range of things. I suppose we'll be doing. Anyway, that's me done. I think. If there are any questions. About some of those protocols and okay, things to learn yeah. from. Um, there's a, a, a and maybe a, are you based in Brisbane? Me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah kind of. <laughs> so Third floor. Second floor. Second okay. Floor. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm ignorant in this space. That's but, all right. But I, um, that's all right. We, we, I'll just flag. Like, we've got a, a a really interesting project that's just emerging with the Secretary of the Pacific Communities. Right. Right. Um, and n now it's. It's dealing with the elite within the Secretary of Pacific Communities. It's, right. You know, it's dealing with the scientists, many of them internationals, and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. um, and and in that project, I don't see any avenue that we'll be working sort of on country in a traditional sense mm -hmm. or with large portions mm -hmm. of the population. So, so it's it's um, nonetheless, I'm still the white expert coming in to tell them how to yeah, do yeah. it. Now, <laughs> so we've we've got a brilliant relationship. Um, with the folks we've been dealing with within SPC, right? Um, but I think I think the project. Well, one we'll be pulling together. I'm currently pulling together a team from across the UQ of, of sort of experts from very different disciplines to, to mm -hmm. feed into that process. Mm -hmm. uh, but the project overall is uh, developing. They're developing a new strategic plan for SPC. So SPC right. is the Secretary of Pacific Communities. It's the peak scientific body of the Pacific Island nation. It's got 26 member states. Um, so, uh, if possible, maybe there's that where we go ch chat down the track and get, get some of your uh, advice and even flagging yeah. people who might be relevant around your queue who, yeah. who, have, who have both got the sort of the disciplinary expertise um, to inform a strategic plan in their mm -hmm. discipline, but also with some knowledge of the Pacific is going to like fill our gaps and all the rest of it anyway. So, yeah. Yeah, I've got a student, a PhD student, actually some data, some data from SBC. So, really? Yeah. So well, I think that's one of the things that will come out of the project, I think, is they've got these enormous data sets. Yeah. And there's a lot of sort of data collecting going that's on right. in SPC. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but they, they don't do data analysis. Yeah, no. I mean, no, I, no, like, no. I could find across their 10 different divisions. There's, right. there's the fisheries, I think, is actually puts out policy briefings. Mm. So their data collecting has been designed for use in, in policy, mm. and they'll do something about it. But most of them just sit there just collecting their data. Yeah, no, no. The number of folks I know at UQ yeah. <laughs> that would want to have a collaborative relationship and then yeah. develop, you know, think of the, what you could, the research that you could do yeah. with people who've got good analysis skills yes. with the folks there who've got the local knowledge and the data. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it could, so that's, that's where you're hoping to take it. Yeah. yeah. But we've got to get the right people on board. And yeah, no, SBC have been monitoring sort of tuna at um, Noro, which is on New Georgia, which is the main salt tuna canning factory. And they got a problem with a thing called mushy tuna, where the tuna breaks down for some reason after it's caught, and they don't know that they can't predict this until it's been through the first stage of processing. Wow. And mushy tuna is basically it's not even cat food, right? Versus a high 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 end product that tuna can be. So they're very keen to work out why it is. SBC's been gathering a lot of data, but as you say, they've not done the analysis. Yeah. Like, so that's yeah. where we're. And I think there's even in little areas, I'm getting sort of hints that there's little areas of kind of caginess about that data too, yeah, in yeah, some yeah, cases. Yeah, yeah. I actually have to get that data, it's really hard. Is even it? with support from FFA and from like the relationship between WCP, Western Central Pacific Tuna, I always get that name, right. and FFA and SPC, it's like, it's really complicated. Right. E even if you have support, I had a 
had support from all the three parties and still couldn't get it. Yeah, right. Yeah, we haven't got the data yet. <laughs> 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 We're like, hoping to get the data. Yeah. <laughs> so, thanks for coming. Cheers. Yes.